All right, now in today's video, I'm actually going to do a little bit of a rediscovery of a uh, operating system that I used to use a long, long time ago, and it's actually back again for the 21st century on a modern, affordable platform. Uh, to first of all, I'll give you a little bit of background. If you've got one of these in your pocket right now, or maybe an Android device, or you've got an iPad, or any form of tablet, chances are that you're probably using a descendant from this company that I'm going to be talking about in a moment. Now I'm talking about Acorn Computers, who were a British company, uh, very famous here in Britain in the 80s and 90s. Uh, so back then, actually, in the early 80s, here in Britain, we did actually have quite a you know thriving computer industry, a homegrown industry, mainly down to two companies, um, and they were Sinclair Research and uh, Acorn Computers. Sinclair, of course, famous for machines like the ZX80, 81, the Sinclair Spectrum, uh, the QL later on in their life as well, and uh, it was run by Sir Clive Sinclair. Of course, uh, I think he's a bit more famous these days for the Sinclair C5 disaster, but you know, he had loads of great machines back in the day, and, and his, his aim was really to make them affordable. But uh, he did have a bit of a falling out and a kind of difference of opinion with one of his employees, who was a guy called Chris Curry, who then left Sinclair Research and went on to form his own computer company, uh, based in Cambridge in Britain, and they were called Acorn Computers. Now, there is actually a BBC drama that was on TV a few years ago, and you'll probably find it on, you know, torrent websites and stuff like that today, called uh, Micromen, it was called, and it details the story of Sinclair and Acorn really well. It's a very good drama, actually. Quite enjoyed watching that. So definitely worth a watch if you want to get a bit more of a background. But anyway, uh, in the early 80s, there was a fierce competition between computer companies to try and be involved in a new project that the BBC, the uh, British Broadcasting Corporation, were uh, putting into practice. Now, it was going to be a series of television programs, and they needed a computer system to go with this. And the goal of it really was, there's going to be some shows on TV that will talk all about this uh, upcoming new microcomputing craze, and they're going to teach programming, and there's going to be an education project. So they need some machines that they can basically have in schools so everybody's on the same page and all using the same hardware, really. So as you can imagine, you know, this was a very, very lucrative deal to whoever got it. Turns out Acorn Computers actually got that in the end. And that meant anyone of my age who went to school in the 80s and 90s used Acorn Computers. You know, they were the industry standard. It started with their 8-bit machines, uh, the Acorn BBC, it was called, to go with the uh, BBC television programme. And then later on, they introduced a 32-bit range of machines called the Acorn Archimedes that um, was really, I think it came around about 1987, and it was the de facto industry standard in schools in Britain until around 1994-95, really. So I was all too familiar with them. And they ran on a RISC CPU architecture called Acorn Research Machines. Now, you'll probably be familiar with the, uh, the initials there, ARM, ARM, that is still, to this day, a massive CPU architecture. Uh, more famous in mobiles and tablets today, but you know, it did start its life on desktop computers from a company called Acorn. And that's kind of their legacy that remains to this day. Now, the operating system that ran on the Acorn Archimedes ARM architecture uh, was a operating system called RISC OS. And that's now back for the 21st century. It never really went away, but you can actually download it for free. And it's been ported to a modern platform that's affordable. And I'm talking about the, uh, the desktop machine that's made uh, ARM architecture popular again, the Raspberry Pi. Now, if you're not familiar with the Raspberry Pi, these have been around for a couple of years now. The goal of them really is, similar to the old Acorn machines, to uh, teach kids programming, really, and be a really good educational tool. Turns out they've got some other really good uses, too, but they're very affordable. You can get one of these, a bare board, for around £25. Um, I actually got mine in a little kit that cost a bit more, but I'll, I'll kind of show you the Raspberry Pi anyway. We'll have a little look around it, I'll explain a few of the features, and then we'll get down to installing the uh, RISC OS port that's been made for the Raspberry Pi. All right, then here's my Raspberry Pi in a nice little case. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the Commodore 64, those uh, colored stripes on there. So I was quite pleased with that. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, you can actually buy the Raspberry Pi bare board for around 25 quid. I actually got mine in a pre-made pack from Maplin. Um, there's the box that it came in there. I'm just panning up so you can have a quick look at it. Now, uh, this kit here came with everything that you need for the Raspberry Pi. It costs a bit more. I think it was nearer 70 quid I paid for it. Um, but you do get quite, you know, pretty much everything you need with it. It came with uh, the case, because usually you buy these cases separately, and they cost around, you know, 10 to 15 pounds anyway, so the price is up to like, you know, like 40 quid by then anyway. 
It came with a, uh, what, a keyboard and mouse, a wireless adapter so it can go on Wi-Fi. It came with a, a charger so you can use it, and a four gigabyte SD card. So I mean, once you factor in the price of all those things, anyway, you know, the, the probably the, the nice box and everything. And the convenience of picking it up rather than mail order probably only cost me about 20 quid more. So I'm quite happy with it. And uh, I think, you know, it's all pretty good quality stuff that comes with it. So uh, inside here, basically, the Raspberry Pi is just a uh, circuit board with a, uh, a few outputs on here. So we've got an Ethernet port on it. Mine is actually a Model B Raspberry Pi, the uh, more recent revision that comes with half a gig of memory on it. I've got two USB ports on here. You have composite video, uh, which is kind of quirky in this day and age. Um, a headphone jack there for audio output, an SD card slot on the side of it there, which is how the Raspberry Pi stores information. There's no hard disk or anything or flash memory on it. Everything that you do is stored on memory cards, which means actually installing different operating systems on the Pi is an absolute cinch. All you do is swap SD cards if you want to try something new. Uh, there we've got the uh, micro USB port that's used for power uh, and on the side of it an HDMI out. Now one cool thing about the Raspberry Pi and one of the things that I actually use it for is as a media center using a bit of software called RasBMC. As uh, this baby will actually do HD video. It can play 1080p video flawlessly. It doesn't skip a beat as it's got a really good graphics chip in as well as the, uh, the ARM CPU. So it makes a nice little, you know, cheap, affordable media center. Uh, but today we're going to have a quick look at installing Risk OS on this ARM based machine. Um, so I'm quickly jump onto the PC and we'll look at the um, Raspberry Pi website and I'll show you how to download and set up Risk OS on your Raspberry Pi. Right then, and here we are on the official Raspberry Pi website. If you need the address, it's raspberrypi.org, although a quick Google search for Raspberry Pi will usually bring this up first result. And the bit that we're interested in is uh, heading over here into the download section of the website. Now, I think the standard OS for the Raspberry Pi, and the one that most people use, is a ARM version of Linux called Raspbian. Wheezy, the latest version of it. Although we want Risk OS, which means we've got to go right down to the bottom of all the operating system list on this website. And you'll find it there at the bottom, Risk OS. And it gives you a bit of a background on it here. Risk OS is a computer operating system designed in Cambridge, England by Acorn, first released in 1987. Its origins can be traced back to the original team that developed the ARM microprocessor. Now, I think there is actually two different versions of Risk OS. It kind of forked into a commercial version and a open source version, which makes things a little bit complicated, although probably beyond the scopes of this video. But uh, luckily, the version that's available here is free of charge to Raspberry Pi users. So you can download it either as a torrent or a direct download. So uh, if we click the direct download, there are a few mirrors on here as well. So you should find a uh, one of them that's working at a decent speed. I've already downloaded it to save a bit of time, so we'll cancel that. And you'll need one more thing as well. You'll need a piece of software called Win32 Disk Imager that you can get from SourceForge. So do Google for Win32 Disk Imager. Uh, download this. Um, and re the reason that you need this bit of software is to write the disk image of Raspbian, uh, of RiskOS, sorry, that we just downloaded to the SD card for use in your Raspberry Pi. So uh, there we go, we've downloaded that now. And actually using all this is pretty simple. As you can see, I'd already downloaded that, so we'll delete that quickly. You need to, first of all, unzip the Risk OS package that you just downloaded. So as you can see, the download for Risk OS, the zip file was only 100 megabytes. In here, we've got a two gigabyte file. The reason he downloads a lot smaller is because this is mostly an empty file. What it is, is a two gigabyte disk image that probably around 100 megabyte of it is used so the rest of it is just free space um, and I have read online that you need to use a 2 gigabyte SD card for this to work now I can confirm that you don't I actually use a 4 gigabyte one for risk OS the only thing is you'll only be able to use 2 gigabytes of it by installing it in this way as it is only a, uh, a 2 gigabyte image that we're going to be writing to the disk if that makes sense so even though you might have a bigger card you'll only be able to use 2 gigs basically so uh, then we'll open the disk, uh, the Windows 32 imager. Uh, quickly open that and zip it all to the desktop here. Right, so what we need to do now, move that onto this monitor, is execute that. Then you need to pick the drive where your SD card is located. Make sure you pick the right one, otherwise you could be overwriting one of your hard disks and that wouldn't be good. You need to pick your image file then, so you quickly navigate to where you downloaded that file. So it was RiskOS. 
and that's the file that we got there. So that's a disk image. It will verify it. Uh, then pretty much it is a case of putting your SD card in, selecting it from this list here, and then just clicking right. Now I won't do that because I've already got Risk OS set up, but um, that should be pretty straightforward for you. Then just transplant that card into your Raspberry Pi, and we'll have a look at how it works. Right then, I've currently got my uh, Raspberry Pi just set up on top of my Amiga 1200 here. Uh, usually I'd never use my Amiga as a table, you do understand. Uh, the reason is though, you know, it's uh, such a tiny little box of Raspberry Pi. doesn't really warrant tidying my entire desk and taking everything else off. So uh, I've got my Raspberry Pi all hooked up to a USB keyboard and mouse um, that are on the table just over there. I've also got an Ethernet wire jacked into it as well that goes into a switch under my table. Uh, the reason I've gone for Ethernet is that although you can use a Raspberry Pi with a wireless adapter on Raspbian and the Media Center, Raspbian MC and all that, I don't actually think that Risk OS supports wireless adapters just yet, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you need it working on Ethernet. It certainly wouldn't work for me on wireless anyway. I've also got an HDMI output there as well, uh, hooked into this monitor. Um, the SD card that we just prepared is in there, and now if I just hook it into the mains, uh, connect up the USB power, we should get it booting up. And listen out for a familiar sound if you're an old BBC user. There you go, did you hear that? Same sound that you get on a BBC or uh, an old Archimedes when you turn them on, the old system beep. Which is nice to see they left it in there. Um, now, I get a little error when I boot mine up for some reason. I think I installed something incorrectly a while back, but as you can see from that screen grab that I showed you before, uh, really, the, the desktop hasn't changed all that much over the years. Uh, you've still got the, the pinboard area, I think it's called here, pinboard. Uh, I can't remember the name of this taskbar down the bottom, but it has got a name. I'm sure uh, Risk OS users will let me know in the comments. Uh, and now, if you look along uh, the bottom here, the way it works is over this side here are programs that are actively running at the moment. So I have mine set to uh, launch this little clock program here. It's actually an alarm, um, but the reason I get it to start up is that it shows me the current time in the, the taskbar, which is quite handy. A little program here for changing the, uh, the screen mode preferences and depth and all that. So... And here's a little kind of like task monitor that shows you, you know, which processes and things are running on the machine and how much memory they're taking up and all that, which is quite useful. Now, on the other side of it here are your devices and your application launcher. Now, if you go on disks, uh, not much in there. So I'll click on that little one there, the SD card, and that will give me a full directory listing of the SD card that, you know, is acting as a hard disk on this machine. So I can go in and look around all of the uh, different directories inside there. If I click on apps, that is a direct shortcut to my install programs in the apps directory. Now, there are a few quirky things about Risk OS, um, and a few things that are very different compared to other operating systems, and actually you need to retrain your brain a little bit. So um, a lot of these apps here that you see kind of date back to the earliest versions. I remember using the draw program. Um, back in my school days in the you know early 90s. So if I double click that uh, to try and launch the draw program, you might be thinking, well, he's double clicked it. Where is it? Well, if you look down the bottom, you'll now see that that is an actively running program. Uh, when you double click things from the pin board, they appear down here, but you need to click them again to actually see what they're doing. So there you go. You can see that's running now. And this does take me back, actually. I remember using this program to... Uh, I think it was one of the first GUI paint packages I ever used actually when I was really small at school. So uh, we'll just do this um, I know, little image here. This is quite handy actually. I can show you how to save a picture because saving in Risk OS and file dialogues are also something that's very different compared to other operating systems that you might be used to. So we'll save that in pictures. Um, and what you need to do is if you go in here, you know, the usual way that you'd save in a paint package, you'll be thinking, all right, you know, right click, save as. If I right click, that is selecting things on the screen. As you can see, you know, right click doesn't really do much in Risk OS. Uh, left click gives you a highlight. How do you get the menu up then? Well, you actually need to click down the, the scroll wheel. So there you go. If I click down, that will then give me a context menu. So uh, it's literally, you've got to just click down your middle wheel here. The reason for that is, it's a legacy thing. On the old Acorn machines, uh, they shipped with a three button mouse. So, you know, the middle button was obviously the second button on the mouse. Uh, before the days of scroll wheels or anything like that, um, it was really valid to use as a, a menu button, you know. There's no reason they shouldn't. Today, it makes it a little bit more complicated, but you just have to retrain yourself to use that. So, uh, also, Risk OS makes heavy use of drag and drop rather than, you know, going through, like, file dialogues and everything. So, I can demonstrate that if I was to save this uh, 
this shit picture I've just made. So we'll go to save on here, go to file, and then it will prompt me for a file name. So we'll give that a quick name. Then if I press OK, watch what happens. To save, drag the icon to a directory display. So what you need to do is, now you've given it a name, you need to literally drag and drop that icon and then drop it into where you want the file to be saved. So there you go, that's now in there. I have to close that and double click that. Let's reopen that picture again. So yeah, that's something that's a little bit quirky. I mean, it's uh, not standard behavior in most operating systems. Middle click over it, then quit to get rid of it. Um, edit, I think, was just a uh, an ASCII text editor, if I remember correctly. Yeah, not much interesting there. But you know, all these programs are legacy programs have been here since uh, the earliest days of Risk OS that I can remember. Um, what's this one here? Paint. Don't know if I remember that one. Looks like a bit more, yeah, more like a, a brushes kind of paint app rather than a, the vector-based draw that we used before. So yeah, they, these are some of the bundled apps that you get with it. And that one thing that's quite quirky about Risk OS, you may look at these uh, the names here and be thinking, what's with all the exclamation marks in front of everything? Well, similar to when you use Windows, you know, executables are often called .exe. On Risk OS, it marks out executables by prefixing them with an exclamation mark. So you look in there, and the uh, the edit program is called exclamation mark edit. There's also help as well that will then, if you run this, um, then hover over things. Launch that help is already running. So it should just send point to things, and it should give you some information. There you go. This is the title bar. Click select to bring and move the window to the top. So then, when the help um, application is running, as you can see, it is down there at the bottom. Uh, then you literally hover over things, and it will tell you about them. So that's quite useful for beginners, I think. So we'll just get rid of that now, though, since we're not using it. Now, if you want to get programs for Risk OS, um, there are a couple of package managers, actually, that you can get these days. Uh, I, now, I'll be honest, I can't remember if these come by default or you need to download them. I've got a feeling they may ship with it already, or at least one of them may. So we'll try this one first. It's called Store, uh, Pling Store, to give it its full name. And as you can see here, we've got a few different cat we can We can do category view, or we can just look at all the applications. Now, most things that you get for Risk OS are free, uh, but there are actually still some paid apps for it, and some of them are actually quite pricey. Look at this one here. We've got Ovation Pro, uh, desktop publishing software, which is £150. Now, I'm not exactly sure who's buying it in this day and age, or whether they even sell many of those. I'm not sure. It could just be legacy software that still works to this day, I suppose. Um, I'm not going to pay the 150 quid to try it out, though. There's another one here, a print server, which is uh, £80. Uh, but most stuff that you'll get is actually free, so um, we can have a little quick look up. Uh, let me see if I can demonstrate something for you. We've got Hatari there, which uh, is an Atari ST emulator apparently. House of Cards, that sounds familiar. A patience game, so we double click that. Um, is, oh, yeah, you've got to pay for this one, it's £5, but there is a free demo by the of it, so we'll download the demo. Um, looks like I've downloaded it before, so we'll have that. We go that appears there. Has cards. Double click that. Uh, continue. We'll try the free trial version. Give myself a name. Uh, let's pick a type of game. There we go. It's a pretty standard patience game. Um, but that yeah, demonstrates how to download things off the package managers. And there are two of them. We've got the Pling Store here, uh, and there's one called Pac-Man as well, which I've got a feeling is a little bit more modern than uh, than the store. So let's we'll open that one. Yeah, it's actually a bit more in this one, as you can see there, we've got a bigger list. So that's how you get applications on Risk OS. Now, bearing in mind this platform's kind of peak was uh, back in the late 80s to very early 90s. There hasn't been a hell of a lot of active development on the platform for the last 20 years or so, but I'm thinking, you know, with the, the port to Raspberry Pi, it opens it up to a whole new audience. And really, this is a playground for, you know, people that want to get into programming and development and... Uh, and try stuff out. You know, there's a lot of things that still need porting to this operating system. I can show you web browsing quickly. Its uh, its main web browser is something called NetSurf. So if I uh, just double click that quickly for you. I'm guessing it's just loading up. Look out for the little blue icon down the bottom there. Unless I didn't click it properly. There we go. Got it that time. Uh, so yeah, if we click on that, it should open it here. Um, we can go on the NetSurf website here. As you can see, it's quite, you know, a lightweight pretty snappy CSS-capable browser. You may have heard of it before, actually. There are um, a few ports of 
NetSurf on different operating systems, and it's available on uh, Amiga OS 4, uh, Atari as well, apparently. I guess that's a uh, toss. Uh, BOS, Linux, Mac OS, and of course Risk OS, which I think is its native platform, really. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a, quite a nice little browser, actually. Now, you're not going to get things like Flash or Java or anything like that on it, but, you know, luckily, those kind of technologies are fading away these days anyway. And there is quite a nice little resource that you can go to called um, riskosopen.org. Now, this website was down when I was trying it a bit earlier on. Uh, oh, no, it seems to be back up now. Uh, so I found this website quite useful for information. Um, like here it says, uh, you know, if there's news there, a new RiskOS show coming up. Uh, Risk OS Open at Wakefield, that's kind of their annual get-together. There's also a forum here, there's bounties at the top there as well, if you want to see what software bounties are going on at the moment. And uh, the forum section, um, which is really useful, I found the people in here really friendly. Particularly as uh, Risk OS has kind of given it a new lease of life, a lot of the developers are very open to uh, newbies and uh, kind of, you know, reintroducing people to it. There's a lot of people like me, I imagine, that used it, you know, 20 years ago and kind of are relearning it again. So I definitely recommend the RiskOSOpen.org forum if you want to learn a bit more about RiskOS. So there you go. I mean, I'm no expert in this system by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but really, I just want to give you a quick demo of how it works and what it looks like. I'm kind of relearning it again from scratch myself. Uh, why would you be interested in it? Well, as I said before, you know, it's kind of a platform that's been dormant for quite a long time. And uh, for people that want to get into development, particularly the Raspberry Pi, the purpose of it is to teach people programming and, you know, to get people into learning how to develop for systems. And uh, that's always kind of been the, old, the goal of the Acorn machines as well. So they're quite a natural fit. I mean, if I want to demo something, if I press F12 on the keyboard, you'll see a little command line will pop up down there. If I zoom in a bit. And just the same as you could on the old Archimedes machines. If I type basic and press return, I'm now into ARM BBC Basic version 5 from uh, 1989. As you can see, the Acorn copyright is still there. So you've got a basic interpreter built straight into the operating system. So, And BBC Basic was one of the more you know advanced and powerful of its generation. So as you can see, it really is, you know, it's, it's designed with development and uh, learning computers in mind. So... If you'd like a platform where, you know, for example, you make an app, pretty much all of the RiskOS community is going to download it if it's good, so you can have a big audience and kind of be well-known in that community. And uh, there is still a lot of things that need porting over to it, so there's a lot of scope. I mean, a lot of things you make for Windows or Linux, you know, everyone's done it before. With this, it's a good playground to experiment and uh, try out new things and get your hands dirty coding, I suppose. So there you go. That's been a quick look at Risk OS on the Raspberry Pi. I'll put the links for the downloads and everything in my video description. Please follow me on Twitter and Google+, all the links for that below as well, and I'll see you in the next video.